hemp is like a truly beautiful plant. If you've ever read the writings of uh, various people who've described it, George Washington had a lot of wonderful stuff to say about it. Thomas Jefferson loved it too. Uh, they were both hemp farmers. The Declaration of Independence was originally written on paper made of hemp. Uh, the Constitution was originally written on paper made of hemp. If we had sowed hemp here a few months ago, you wouldn't even be able to see the street here. It'd just be... <laughs> This is the 90s. People, places, and ideas from all over the world. Most of this week's program is about a common plant, hemp. Hemp is a plant that has been illegal to grow in the United States since 1937. One of the uses for the hemp plant is marijuana. There are also many other uses for hemp, including making paper. But here we have some papers that are made from hemp. This one, as you see, just to give you a difference, uh, this is like almost like a wood pulp here. This one, on the other hand, uh, is a real soft paper you can use yeah. for wrapping paper for tea bags and things like uh -huh. this like for paper. straining yeah uh, or for coffee filters and so forth mm -hmm. we also I don't have a sample with me but we've got it to uh, you can make any kind of paper out of it so your basic print runs in fact this basically I would say that this piece right here demonstrates you uh, exactly why marijuana is illegal because William Randolph Hearst like I said he had the had gotten the uh, permits to cut down the trees in the Northwest United States to make paper, um, but however, as you notice from this paper, it looks like newsprint. It's the same kind of a quality of paper as what you would get from cutting down trees. However, it only takes uh, about one-fifth to one-eighth as much of the chemicals, and it lasts something like five to ten times longer. Uh, and it's just as recyclable and just as good in every other way, and you don't have to cut down any trees for it at all. And so Hearst realized that if there was something else out there that could do all these things without cutting down trees, that a lot of people wouldn't want the trees cut down. And so therefore he had to eliminate the one thing that could come between him and being able to make those millions and billions of dollars by cutting down and deforesting the Northwestern United States. And so all of a sudden marijuana became a big problem. As it turned out, William Randolph Hearst discovered that marijuana was a big problem, which no one else had ever heard of before. Uh, it was coming up from Mexico. No one knew anything about it, but it seemed to drive people insane and cause violence and do all these horrible things. Well, something had to be done. And, and, and he, had the, he had the media to make sure that the, that the population knew it. You're right. Yeah. Newspapers all over the country, yeah. from Florida to California, suddenly realized that marijuana is a big problem. And people were wearing their Levi jeans made out of hemp uh, and, and reading about marijuana. And, and no one knew what it was, but it was like the devil's weed or something that was coming up from Mexico. And everybody knew that Mexicans were lazy. You know, and, and, and blacks were smoking it. It turned out they discovered that people in uh, New Orleans, the black people were smoking this. And not only that, but then white people were smoking it with them. And then the blacks and the whites were hanging out together. And then, you know, what else was happening? That sometimes when blacks and whites were walking down the street, the blacks wouldn't step out of the way when the whites came from the other direction. And they were even known to look white people in the eye. They were, like, stepping on their shadows. The situation was getting completely out of control in America. And it was all because of marijuana, which no one had ever heard of before. But... <laughs> It became very important that we have a law on the book. And in 1937, the, some, the DuPont family, uh, the Mellons, the Hearsts, etc., had a series of, of secret meetings where they were discussing what could be done about this marijuana problem that's facing this country. And so they came up with the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937, uh, which went into effect in 1938. And curiously enough, after the name, it didn't talk about marijuana anymore. From then on, it talked about hemp. Hmm. But the name of the act was the Marijuana Tax Act, and so uh, when they were having the hearings finally about it, uh, they had someone from the uh, hemp seed, the Seed Oil Institute come and talk about the long history of people eating hemp seed and, and doing all these things with the hemp seed. And um, the AMA came and said, look, we can't make this plant illegal. It's it's the most useful medicinal plant that we know of. It's an herb, you know, it's got, we're using it in all these medicines all over the place. Uh, we can't afford to make it illegal. And so the, uh, one of the congressmen said to him, well, so then, well, why didn't you tell us about this earlier? If this is such an important thing, why didn't, and they said, well, because only two days earlier had anyone told them that it was cannabis was what marijuana was. They didn't know what marijuana was. Uh, if they had known there was a law about cannabis, they would have been there against it from the beginning. But because they didn't know that, 
it only found out two days before. That was their first chance to come and say anything. And so that's what they did. And uh, by then it was too late. I am a candidate for governor in the May 91 Democratic primary in the state of Kentucky. And my main, my main issue is choice. Uh, my main issue and fear is that the whole bundle of rights of individual free choice held by the individuals in this country and citizens in this country, the kinds of freedoms that our forefathers fought and died for since 1776, that our subsequent generations have gone to war for, are now under assault by the present administration and the past administration and its two terms stay in office. These people, Ronald Reagan and George Bush, are not conservatives. These people are aliens. These people have nothing to do with conservatism. When I was growing up, I'm a conservative candidate. I want to license and regulate marijuana as a cash crop and let our farmers make this money instead of make these international criminal syndicates in South America and Mexico rich. And uh, the current administration calls itself conservative. But when I was growing up, conservative meant you kept the government in a little box. You didn't let it out. The government stayed in a little box because when you let government out of that box, it started exponentiating and feeding upon itself, becoming self-serving and always against the interest of the people. Inexorably, it will grow to occupy the space currently occupied by our civil liberties, and it has been doing so for the last 40 years. Ronald Reagan snookered the public and said that he was going to take government off the backs of business. He did that, but he put government directly on the backs of the people. He took all that built-up government, he gutted the social programs, and took all that money and fed his cronies with it, and then bought in the military and the police force to ride herd on the population. That's exactly what's happened. I'm going to reverse that effect. When I get to be governor of the state of Kentucky, I'm going to put that government back in the box. I'm going to tell the government, we don't have the right to interfere in a lot of different aspects of individuals' lives in this state. Marijuana is a benchmark question for many reasons. Number one, a society that can accommodate alcohol and tobacco has absolutely no argument with marijuana, which is far less harmful than either of those two. Uh, the state has no right to tell the individual he cannot alter his consciousness. If he can do that respectably and, uh, and uh, in a uh, nonviolent or threatening manner, then he should be able to do that. Not with addictive drugs. Not with addictive drugs. I am not talking about legalizing drugs. I'm talking about licensing and regulating marijuana as a cash crop in the state of Kentucky. I can kick crack and cocaine and heroin out of the state of Kentucky. I can solve that problem. My granddaddy never grew crack or cocaine or heroin, but he used to grow the hell out of him. And when he did, we used to make a pretty penny on it. I'll kick crack and cocaine and heroin out because what I'm going to do is I'm going to tax and regulate the marijuana smoker and remove them as a buffer zone from around the hard drug market. You know, as a marijuana smoker, I resent being forced to run involuntary interference with the hard drug market. I don't belong in that same category. I, I will not be placed in that same category. And I sure as hell, I'm not going to be going through my life as an adult in this society looking over my shoulder, wondering when the government is going to pounce out and haul me off and hold me in a cage for ransom because of my association with the green plant my granddaddy used to grow. You know, if we're going to fight about this, we're going to fight about it in front of the courthouse with a bullhorn at 12 noon in the sunshine with the public watching. And if we're going to fight about it, we're going to fight about it politically and through the system. And we're just going to flat take over the system and remove this kind of asinine fascist law and this kind of asinine fascist mentality from existence in this society. Cool. All right. Welcome to the hash bag. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
No, not necessarily. The rest of the country is crazy. I'm saying that uh, the rest of the country uh, has a lesson to be learned from what's happened here in Ann Arbor and other places that have had compassionate approaches to those that smoke marijuana. A lot of the hash bash is involved with trying to reform the, uh, the marijuana laws, and we're taking it a step further. We're basically saying that most of the problems of drugs are a result of drug policy. They are not a result of the use of drugs. In fact, less than 1% of America is addicted to illegal drugs. Um, there are many more users, but that's a very important point. You, know, you have to separate use from abuse. We're in no way interested in promoting abuse. You know, we'd love to see it. The whole country does not use drugs, but by the same token, we're not willing to see people give up all their constitutional liberties just to get rid of drugs. I mean, that, that seems like a very un-American thing to do. Just say more. What's that? What's more? Instead of just say no, just like say joke, more. Kind of. uh, Ma'am, I'm a candidate for governor in the state of Kentucky and Democratic Party. They know marijuana does not make you crazy. They know marijuana does not lead you to crime. They know marijuana does not lead you to harder drugs. But marijuana is a system of control that they can exercise over you because you step out of line from their corporate policies. China makes most of the hemp clothing now, and these are imported from China, because in this country you're not allowed to grow it for clothing or for anything. So you're really protesting for marijuana cigarettes and hemp shirts? No, what I'm protesting for is the right to be able to use a relatively benign substance. The campus of the University of Michigan is a highly political campus. You have all the pro-Israel groups, you have the, the pro-Arab, the pro-Palestinian groups, you have all the free South Africa. So it's sort of good to have, or refreshing to have something like this for students to gather and have a nice day, afternoon, eat some lunch, the turkey sandwich, everybody. Tease. The new TV network for the new decade. It's full of surprises, 24 hours a day on this cable channel. You've got a minute. I'd like to remind you of a few park policies. I don't think you're aware of these policies. And let me remind you that there's no running, removal of plant or animal life, no shoes, no shirt, no service. No inflatable animal or persons allowed. No tomfoolery, no grab ass, no horseplay, no roughhousing. No drugs, no heroin, crack, blow, marijuana, weed, pot, cannabis, dope, lid, reefer, Mary Jane, 13, M, Herb, shake, flake, downtown. What do you got, boy? What's in that pocket of yours? What? What are you laughing at? He's P.O.'d, and he's a park ranger. He's P.O.'d park ranger. Kids are getting an awful message from the uh, advertising and the... And the propaganda that comes out of the White House, that all drugs are the same, that what's important is that if a drug's legal or illegal, that that's how we judge whether they're dangerous or not. That just isn't right. That's setting up kids for um, endless bouts of uh, doubt about uh, adults and authority and what they say and whether it can be trusted. Minorities, their communities are being used as the uh, staging zones for the uh, drug uh, warriors to attack the dealers. And if you think about it, the easiest and the cleanest, and in fact the only way to clear out the inner city would be to legalize drugs. If you believe nothing else about the war on drugs, you have to believe it's regressive. It's ultimately in the service of saving somebody in the suburbs from themselves at the cost of turning the inner city into a war zone. The fact of the matter is that uh, uh, marijuana, uh, of course, in terms of our society, 11 states, uh, for example, have uh, lifted the prohibition against uh, marijuana. There is some people say that it is the growing of marijuana is the second cash crop in California. Uh, it is uh, true that in 1972, uh, the commission reporting to President Nic Nixon recommended then uh, that marijuana be legalized. And uh, the National Ab Academy of Sciences repeated the same uh, recommendation a number of years ago. Uh, there is, uh, in, in truth, 
the American people have learned that uh, the threat of reefer madness, uh, some may remember that film, it, the uh, gist of it was that if you smoke one marijuana cigarette, well, then you were condemned to marijuana use forever and uh, your life would be destroyed. Well, the American people have learned that that's just not so. Uh, but the principle remains the same, whether it's uh, marijuana or it's one of the other uh, drugs. Now, quite obviously, uh, cocaine and crack are uh, much more serious in terms of addiction because of their uh, pharmacological effect. Uh, the effect of the drug gets directly to the brain uh, when it's smoked, and it, uh, it is a much more powerful uh, drug. But the principles that uh, I think are controlling uh, apply equally to marijuana and uh, to cocaine. Now, that's as a matter of principle. Uh, but I suppose if one wanted to be practical about it, 75% of the arrests in our criminal justice system uh, are marijuana arrests. And uh, uh, if we were simply to take that step uh, and uh, eliminate the prohibition against marijuana, if we were to just take that step, of course, it would ease the burden on the criminal justice system considerably. But as a matter of principle, it seems to me it doesn't address uh, the basic problem. And the basic problem is a problem of money and will. And we must uh, face up to that. For the new decade, shattering the limits of conventional TV, 24 hours a day on this cable channel. Hi, we're back with another 90s progress report. What you're watching now is a brand new episode of the 90s. One that's made possible by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. But almost half of the money from the MacArthur grant requires us to raise a dollar for dollar match. Let me call your attention to the all too frequent announcements on this channel asking you to become a member of the 90s. If you've been thinking about joining the 90s, there's never been a better time. The MacArthur Foundation will double the amount of your tax deductible donation. And if you're already a 90s member, please accept our thanks. We're also giving our cable viewers first chance to participate in a new feature known as the 90s Hotline. The 90s Hotline works something like a letters to the editor column, only better. If you have an opinion about a story on the 90s or a topic you want to bring to the attention of 90s viewers, call our hotline. We'll record your message. You can leave songs, screeds, jeremiads, essays, odes of praise, any creative form you choose. The 90s producers will sift through hotline messages and they'll pick excerpts to include in future programs. Soon, the 90s hotline may switch to a 900 number. But for now, call us at plain old 303-649-6411 any time of the day or night. Our trusty voicemail computer is standing by. If you're new to the 90s channel, you'll discover that our programs are repeated a lot. Veteran 90s viewers have learned the trick to watching us. If you get tired of the repeats, turn us off. But be sure to tune us in again the next week, because something different and special will be on again. As always, we welcome your correspondence. You can write to the show's producers at the Chicago address in the credits, or you can write to us here at the 90s channel. That's P.O. Box 6060, Boulder, Colorado, 80306. You get to these smaller ones here, you get into this area, you're looking at something you can make even a lace out of. That fine of a fabric. Like I said, they say you couldn't tell the flats from the hemp, and right now they're making blends of hemp and silk that are supposedly as good as silk. You get a little bit of the fiber here to see how this all works. It comes apart, and in the middle here is the soft stuff. This is the uh, pulp. If you're going to make paper, this is what you want. This part in the middle here. If you're going to make fabric, you want this part, okay? Now, if you're going to do a uh, paper, you also want a lot of pulp. And so this is the kind of a stem you're looking for, something nice and thick. The branches are spread out a little bit more so. Uh, the, the stem is nice and uh, solid. You just want as much mass as you can get, for, especially if you want it to go into the energy thing, which is if you want it to do biomass, uh, this is a way of replacing fossil fuel by using organically grown substances. It solves a number of problems. It reduces the amount of sulfur because there's no sulfur in these plants. So you won't get sulfur dioxide, meaning you won't get sulfuric acid, and you don't get acid rain. Okay. Uh, the other thing about it is that when the plant is growing, it's constantly 
through photosynthesis is taking uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and replacing it with free oxygen. So that if you use this and you, that process you can make it into charcoal, will burn the same as coal but without any uh, sulfur in it. Uh, you can make gasoline out of this. You can make electricity from the coal that you've just burned. You can make methanol from this. You can make methane gas out of it. You can crush the seeds. If you get oil and use that as a seed oil, you can, uh, there's no other plant that can produce as wide of a variety of, rain, of uh, locations as much of a mass as this plant. And that's what it comes down to when it comes to biomass. It's the mass of the plant, the cellulose, that's being converted into energy uh, in a much cleaner format than what we have here uh, with fossil fuels. And so, um, like I say, so you want some nice, thick, solid plant that's going to put out a fair amount of branches, but nice, solid, uh, big mass. In the 1850s or so, petroleum was a nuisance. Uh, right now, the petrochemical and the pharmaceutical companies control this country. They control Congress. They control the economy. Uh, but 100, uh, 140 years ago, that was not the case. Petroleum was a nuisance. They were after salt water and brine and other minerals when they came across petroleum. It wasn't until the 1890s, 1900s, and 1910s that they found out what petroleum could be used for as far as synthesizing products. That they then found out they could make fiber out of it, they could make medicine out of it, they could make all kinds of fuel out of it. And they conspired to assume a monopoly over those commodities in this country. And looking around, they realized what it took me 18 years to realize, that the greatest competitive product that the most petroleum-like substance that could be produced from the natural cycle of things was hemp. Hemp is petroleum. Everything you make out of petroleum, you can make out of hemp, including cellophane, plastics, TNT, explosives, motor oil, fuel, cloth, medicine, food. Hemp is the most beneficial plant that mankind has ever domesticated on this globe. And the petrochemical industries took advantage of the flood of New Deal legislation in 1936 and 7, when government and business struck a new deal, leaving people and the citizen out of the negotiations. Government and business struck a new deal whereby the industries and corporations wrote the regulations that were to govern them under this new deal, which was, in fact, a controlled economy. A controlled economy in, uh, in uh, response to the Depression and the anticipation of World War II, which they knew they were going to get into. That all this New Deal legislation came about where all these regulations were written to regulate all these industries, but they were written by those very industry executives. And th what those regulations did, in effect, was to give the monopolies to the large industries, specifically the petrochemical industries in this country. For instance, it is no coincidence that in 1937, hemp was outlawed and nylon was patented. The true, real battle going on today uh, had its inception uh, formally in the 1937 New Deal legislation. And what it comes down to is a present-day battle, not between the cops and the robbers, not between communism and free enterprise, not between black and white, not between Muslim and Christian. The real true battle today and on this planet is the natural cycle versus the synthetic cycle of things. Between the softest drugs, like marijuana, you know, not like really like alcohol or tobacco, like marijuana, it's more benign than all the tobacco and alcohol put together. But the Mormons, and I respect the Mormons, uh, they don't believe in alcohol. But there's no total prohibition. You can go, walk into a government store and you can buy alcohol. Well, they should do that with marijuana. They should legalize marijuana. That is, they should allow it to be grown. Doesn't hurt anyone. Every statistic said that. There is no nexus between marijuana and cocaine or heroin or methamphetamine. There is no stepping stone. You know, that's an invention. No one who has studied that accepts that if you do marijuana next minute, you know, next hour, next year, you're going to be shooting heroin or anything else. This total prohibition is what is historically aberrant. That's unwise to prohibit. By prohibition, and we do prohibit in this country, we have created a criminal class. We have created this so-called drug problem, this terrorism, you know, this thing that ultimately now, 
is unchecked and causing, from my perspective, a reason for a grasping, you know, overzealous executive class to grab more power. They use that as the excuse. It begins the moment you touch down in LAX. Quick bits of unusual and sometimes infuriating TV. 24 hours a day on this cable channel. This electronic cartoon from Washington is brought to you by Gross National Product. This is D.C.'s Mayor Barry. This is drugs. This is the mayor on drugs. Any questions? I think that, uh, you know, that the herbs should be legalized because there is, as I say, a big difference between smack crack and smoking flowers. And I'm sick and tired of my friends being dragged off or their houses or cars being confiscated for a joint of marijuana when uh, there are 500,000 deaths a year from uh, alcohol and nicotine. I mean, come on, let's get real here. Otherwise, kids are going to think uh, because they smoke the grass and it doesn't mess them up, they shoot a little smack, and uh, they're going to end up... Uh, uh, death is Patrick Henry's second choice, the sleep that rots, you know? It's no fun. So uh, uh, what I suggest you do is uh, let's legalize it. We could do it if we got together. We could do anything. I mean, we stop Vietnam. We could stop all war. We could feed the hungry. They're, they're, they're more pressing issues than this, and, and more that I devote my life to. But uh, this is definitely, uh, you know, and it's, uh, it's part of my spiritual life is smoking some herb, you know? Well, why can't we do that? Uh, I think because the energy barons and the death merchants would rather we didn't. They'd, they'd rather uh, us uh, consume uh, uh, the nicotine and the lush. Uh, perhaps because uh, if everybody uh, uh, grew grass, uh, we discovered that we could turn it into energy and turn it into paper and turn it into run our cars on it and stop uh, the global warming and all that stuff that I'm sure you've heard ad nauseum. Let's talk about something else for a change. <laughs> what are your favorite TV shows? My favorite TV shows are The Simpsons, Night Music, and the 90s. The 90s are the 60s standing on your head. <laughs> These are the good old days. Wake up, my children. Babylon will fall. for the taste of true Jamaica. No tourist apartheid for me. As my dread luck would have it, my third world witch doctor was just around the corner. My number is number one, Ruth Man in Negro. My main man, Juicy, will help me out. Wash my brain juicy with your roots tonic water. Juicy! Hey, I'm I need the man. juice! You ready, dear? Hey, man! It's like, in, oh, okay. right forget the Wheaties, brother! Inside, man. Go right you don't in. need no Wheaties! Go in, man. Make you feel fit in your body and strong and healthy and clean. 
juicy, juicy. <laughs> what makes your roots juice so good, man? Well, I said cherry root, Irish marsh, linseed, blood with, strong back, and saucy pearl with honey and ice and nutmeg. And it make you love your girl. Love your girl every time. <laughs> make you feel honey to love her. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh. But when you have my drinks, man, if you sick, you have to better. And if you go to the doctor, the doctor can hardly better you. No, 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 no medicine, no pill. But when you drink roots that the good Lord made from the earth, nothing stop that. Your body's clean Juicy's and fit. tonic hits the spot. But I need the number one shot. Give me the herb. Poppin' Fresh is an Ital trend. He grows his marijuana without chemical fertilizers. He's from the old school, before the chemicals and the DEA helicopters rained death over Jamaican ganja fields. Oh, she's turning out to be a beauty, man. Do you believe that the native sativa can be stronger if you don't use fertilizer? Yeah, man, because the fertilizer that they use, the fertilizer is not too good. It doesn't suppose up the ganja and it have no taste. It don't taste right, you know? So the fertilizer is not too good for the ganja. But when you go natural from the natural style, then you get a better, mm -hmm. better smoke from it. If you use even rat bat shit or cow shit or something mm -hmm. like that, it's much, much more stronger. And we spoke of how hard it is to find good herb nowadays. What do you think about the current situation with the zero tolerancy in the U.S.? Do you believe that this has a a direct effect on the Jamaican economy? Yeah, man, because a lot of people suffer, man, because a lot of people could have, could sell a little herb and they could have money and they could do what they want to do and they could send a kid to school and they could do a lot of things which they wish to do. Mm -hmm. But now through the helicopter coming around, they cannot get it no more, so everybody starts to suffer again, the separation again, you know? So we do a lot to Jamaica. So we have to free up the herb farm, yeah, man. free up the marijuana because Marijuana is a herb. It's not like cocaine or no, heroin. Man. It 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 is a, a something that's a blessed can, blessed plant. It's a blessed plant. that can give you a little happiness. You're watching the '90s, the new TV network for the new decade, with people, places, and ideas from all over the world, 24 hours a day on this cable channel. Film 90s. We should never have a conversation about drugs that talks about pot and crack in the same paragraph. And we do it all the time. And that just makes no sense. In fact, you know, if we were going to start to have a wish list of drugs we'd want to disappear from the universe and maybe the first one was crack I'm not sure the second one wouldn't be tobacco and in any case whatever you think of that I'm, I, I don't see what law enforcement adds except to people's misery you know if you have been keeping up with the recent economic conditions in the world you are more than aware of the dwindling value of the American dollar. Now, El Banco de Santo Spirit, the bank of the Holy Spirit, offers American people the opportunity to invest their money in our bank and we convert it into the European concurrency of your choice. If you have at least $1,000 to deposit, and you do it before the first of any quarter. You get to add these beautiful, beautiful Italian kid gloves. They come in blue, beige, brown, black, or pearl white. If 
you do not want the gloves. I know you would want them, but you have the choice. You can also ask for this beautiful 1963-273 edition of the Guide to Patron Sex. It's got a new chapter here with all of the latest changes. To give you just a, a little taste, let me tell you that the Saint Saud of Ankara, the patron saint of hard drugs, is no longer responsible for marijuana. Marijuana is now under Saint Rolando of Marsala, the patron saint of a beer and wine. I was born in New York, right here up, uh, near St. Vincent's. Uh, I thought when I grew up that people would be reasoning adults, and I found out they weren't. What is to be done when you have people inhabiting the planet and they don't know what to do? I guess you'll have to teach them. That's responsibility has fallen to me because there seems nobody else who is doing it. And so I am the Pope. I am self-appointed. I am a little bit righteous. But what is to be done? If nobody speaks to the questions, then who is going to do it? You are responsible. I say in my church that everybody is responsible. We inhabit a planet. What is to be done with it? Should we create the kingdom of heaven? Or shall we make insane uh, greed and stupidity, which in the end will only annihilate us? Here we have a plant that can save the world, marijuana, the most useful plant known to our species. It is good to make clothes with. We can eat the oil or use it for any other oil product. It grows quickly. It helps conserve the soil. It's, uh, it's medical. It uh, relieves symptoms of diseases where there is no other alternative for any sane individual to take. The safest, the only safe drug to not realize this is species destructive. Everything that you can make from whale oil, you can make from hemp oil. And so the parts of the world where they're killing the whales right now because they need uh, these different products, they could actually be satisfied 100% and all the whales could be saved, except for primarily uh, what happened is that there's a treaty that was forced upon the world by the United States in 1961. And that, that treaty itself is the only thing that's blocking us from using hemp to save the whales. Uh, the other thing that you would say, well, people buy, they kill whales also to eat the meat, but there's more protein in this bag than there would be in a uh, slab of cow or of whale, and uh, then all you need to do is flavor it. You could process it and texturize it to where it would have the same consistency as the, <laughs> the whale meat, and then you just flavor it, and that takes care of that other problem. And now so. you're going to tell me it's better than ice cream. Too. <laughs> Well, actually, what you can do is you can take him, make it into tofu, take the tofu, make it into tofuti. It's other people whether they like tofuti better than uh, ice cream, but it, you can accomplish the same thing, essentially. Oh, Major funding for the 90s was provided by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, sponsor of the MacArthur Library of Videotapes and the MacArthur Video Classics, available at more than 2,000 public libraries, and by the Instructional Telecommunications Foundation, publisher of the 90s newsletter, your source of behind-the-scenes information about the 90s TV series. For a free copy, call 1-800-FILM-90s. We want to know what you think about the 90s, so write with questions or comments to The 90s, Wrigley Building, Chicago, Illinois, 60611.
Or you can send a fax to the 90s anytime to 312-321-9.